Last week, we began a new message series called Finding Faith. We believe this message series is important because it will help us understand better the essentials of our faith. It will help us live into a portion of our St. Paul mission statement, which is to glorify God, grow in faith, and give in love. And this message series is supposed to help us grow in faith. But it's also supposed to teach us how to be better witnesses, better representatives of a world, in a world filled with people who don't believe as we believe. So today we turn um, to a different question. Last week, Pastor Bob um, taught on the question of, does what we believe really matter? And I hope you left here as I did with the answer, yes, in your mind. And today we're going to turn to the question, is there a God? Now, you might be sitting there and thinking, well, this could be a really short sermon because, after all, we're here in church today, right? Is there a God? The answer is yes. Let's have communion and go home, right? No, not right. Because there's much that we need to consider when we talk about the question that there, is there a God? Because there are people in our culture who profess a belief in Jesus and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who seem to worship wealth and power and position and their children's achievements and their possessions more than they worship the one true God. There's people in our community who say, yes, there's God, but I don't believe in this Father, Son, and Spirit stuff, and certainly not Jesus. And then there are those who walk among us and say, there is no God the atheist. And rather than shun them and turn away from them, we are called to witness to them. But to do that, we need to understand where they're coming from. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. As Christians, we need to reframe the question, is there a God, into several more probing qu questions. The first is, is our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God? Is Jesus essential to a full understanding of who God is? How do we talk about God to people who don't believe as we believe? And finally, how do we reconcile our belief in a God that cannot be, who cannot be fully explained in the midst of a culture where science attempts to explain everything, and there are those who say, if science can't explain it, I won't believe it. So that's our challenge today and why we're going to spend some time with this question. And to do that, we're going to look at John's Gospel, chapter 9. Now, the, the setting of the story that we'll look at uh, takes place in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus has come to Jerusalem, and in chapter 7 and chapter 8, which precede this chapter, you'll find that he has had a few occasions to have disagreements with the Pharisees. They are after him. They are trying to find fault with him. They are questioning in whose name he heals, uh, who gives him authority to speak as he does. So he has been bickering with the Pharisees, and that bickering continues with our story from John chapter 9. So let's begin at the very beginning of that chapter. As he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. He spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. So at first, what did this man know about Jesus? Not a lot. He knew that he had been blind from birth, and now he could see. But he didn't yet realize or understand that not only was he given physical sight to be able to see with the eyes that are at the front of his face, but he was going to be in the process on this day and the days that followed of gaining spiritual sight as well. Because he wanted to understand the man who healed him, he kept thinking about Jesus. And by the end of the story, we'll understand that he found his answer. Now let me ask you, if you had a neighbor who was blind from birth, and they came home one day and could see, wouldn't you rejoice for them? Wouldn't you be happy for them? Of course you would. 
But that's not what this man's neighbors did. He came home, and they were filled with questions, even doubting that he was the man who had been blind. This is how John describes the story. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, others said no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Instead of being amazed by this incredible miracle and healing, instead of rejoicing, they asked how. How could this happen? They weren't asking the right question. The question isn't how. The question they should have been asking is who? Who could perform a miracle like that but the Son of God? But they didn't understand that. And so in some ways, they were like the atheist. They could not believe what they could not explain. But there are other reasons that people adopt the position of the atheist, that there is no God. They look around the world and they see the hurt and the suffering. They see the evil that takes place and affects so many people. They say, I don't believe in God because if, if there was a God and God was good, that none of that could happen. That's a question that in the worlds and words of faith, we call the, the subject of theodicy. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there evil in the world that God created? And I'm sorry to say that if you're in the midst of suffering and hurt or pain, if you are at a time when you're asking this kind of question, and frankly, I was in a time where I was asking these questions just a few years ago, even after I was commissioned to be a deacon, having someone explain that, well... The answer is that God didn't promise you a rose garden. God didn't promise you that there would be no suffering or hurt in your life. But what God did promise and what God did do is he came to this earth and dwelled among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Suffered as we suffer. Hurt as we hurt so that we could trust that when we are in a time of suffering and hurt, that God is indeed with us. And that, friends, is the only answer I have for you to the theodicy question. Because God didn't promise that everything would be good on this earth. Our promise is for everlasting life in the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. You know, I read a book by a guy who kind of went through some theological wrestling. His name was Mike Mahargue. He wrote a book called Finding God in the Waves, and he tells a story about how he was raised in a uh, pretty fundamental evangelical church, and when he got to be a teen and in his 20s and he started asking some hard questions about theodicy, instead of welcoming his questions and wrestling with him over his doubts, the people in his church basically said, you shouldn't ask questions like that. That's not being faithful. I mean, you, that indicates you're not a person of faith. And eventually he became not a person of faith. He walked away from the church. He relied on science. He started a podcast. I don't know if it's still broadcast today called Science Mike. But God didn't let Mike go. God continued to woo him and put questions in his mind, and he went through a process of finding more and more things about what the Bible says that he could prove. He was willing to say Jesus existed. He was a man who walked the earth. He was a wonderful teacher, a great moral example, example just not God. But friends, that's not good enough. That's not enough. If we're going to answer the question, I believe, do I believe God is real with an answer of yes. But eventually Mike kept wrestling and he did come to a place in his faith where he understood that science would only allow him to reach so far and then he would have to make that leap of faith to believe some things that he could not see and could not prove. So the story had a happy ending and it can have a happy ending 
for others who say there is no God if we indeed act as the church. Because you see, sometimes religious people think they have all the answers to the question, is there God? There were some people in the blind man's life who were about to enter this story who thought they had all the answers. They were called Pharisees. And they had concerns about the fact that the man was healed because it happened on the Sabbath. They were worried about when instead of who. Again, they asked the wrong question. This is how John continues with this story of the blind man who was given sight. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had re received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. And then in the scripture, the Pharisees continue to bicker among themselves about who this Jesus was, and was it okay for him to heal or not. And ultimately, they asked this man, who do you think Jesus is? And the man replied, well, he's a prophet. So with the neighbors, he had said, Jesus is a man, but now to the Pharisees, he's saying, Jesus is a prophet. So he's grown a little bit in his understanding. He's not there yet, but he's growing. A little later, after meeting the blind man's parents, who wanted nothing to do with a discussion with the Pharisees because they were afraid that they would be thrown out of the temple, and the whole life in Jerusalem at that time centered around life in the temple and in the community of the temple. So they dodged the questions and ultimately said to the Pharisees, talk to our son. He's an adult. He can speak for himself. They kind of threw him under the bus to tell you the truth if you read the story, and I hope you will. So the man is called to appear again before the Pharisees who want to inquire further. But in this exchange, we see that he's starting to understand. This lowly beggar who couldn't see, who was the least in the community, suddenly has grown the courage to throw some words back at the Pharisees and to question the things they're saying. And this is how their second exchange unfolded. The Pharisees told the blind man, that Jesus was a sinner and they condemned him. This is what he said. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? You think maybe he was being a smart aleck? I do. They'd been bothering him, his parents, and he'd had about enough. Then they hurled insults at him and said, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from? Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God... He could do nothing. Compare and contrast this man with the religious leaders. They thought they had eyes to see and understand. But this man, who just gained his sight that day or the day before, understood more about real faith than the religious leaders understood. They were too busy being prideful, being arrogant, being protected of the status quo, they were too busy keeping the rules. They did not want to believe. And so they denied that Jesus was the Messiah. Instead, they wanted their God to remain limited by the experience and the tradition that they already had. They couldn't conceive that God has done something new in the person of Jesus Christ. Compare that to the faith of the blind man. The day before he was blind... His physical blindness was healed, and he first referred to Jesus as the man called Jesus. He graduated a little further and called him a prophet. He then told the Pharisees that this man Jesus was from God. But his real understanding of who Jesus was 
didn't come until he had a second encounter with Jesus. Because you see, the Pharisees lived up to their terrific reputation, and they threw the man out of the temple. And Jesus heard this, so he went and found the man. And this is what they talked about. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. From Jesus is a man, to Jesus is a prophet, to Jesus is from God, to Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. You see, it's hard for us today. We're asked to believe lots of things that we can't see, that we weren't present to witness firsthand. In some ways, while I'm very glad I'm not blind, I'm a little jealous of this blind man. Because he got to see Jesus face to face. He got to talk to Jesus face to face where he could put a hand on his arm and, and feel his robe and his, the muscles of his arm. He could believe because he could see and because he experienced. But we're asked to believe without seeing. There was an apostle who had trouble with believing without seeing. Remember him? A few weeks ago, Pastor Bob spoke about him when he was preaching in our Fearless series, or Fearless series. His name was Thomas. And after the resurrection took place and Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas was absent at the time. The others told him, Jesus is alive. He was resurrected. And Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it unless I see him and put my fingers on his wounds. So Jesus appeared again this time with Thomas present. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Now listen to this. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Friends, that's us. Unlike the blind man, we are asked to believe what we cannot see. We are asked to believe what science cannot explain. We are asked to believe in things that seem to defy biology class that we all took in high school. There's no medical or scientific explanation for the virgin birth or the resurrection. But Jesus tells us, that we're blessed if we believe what we didn't see, but what we certainly can read about in Scripture. But there are some mysteries that we do experience, and too often we don't even treat them as though they're mysteries. I'm talking about when we celebrate the sacraments. The Greek word for sacrament is mysterion. Sounds a lot like mystery, doesn't it? When we celebrate the sacraments, we are supposed to experience a miracle on the inside. When we're baptized, water is sprinkled on us. And then Pastor Bob makes the cross on the forehead of the person being baptized and calls upon the Holy Spirit to indwell the baptized one, even when the baptized one is a teeny baby and can't possibly understand when we celebrate the sacrament of communion, we take bread, we take grapes that have been turned into wine as a beverage or as Welch's grape juice as a beverage. We use these ordinary symbols, things we can buy in the store, symbols of our everyday life, but they're symbols of a miracle that takes place within us when God imparts to us his grace through the use of things we can see and feel. But we need to believe in the miracle. So how does it feel to experience a miracle? A miracle that you can't explain. You can see symbols of the miracle, but I hope inside you felt the transforming power of the Holy Spirit 
nourishing you yet again. This is the way we experience the miracle. Let us also embrace God in all the amazing remainder of his mystery, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us embrace words that God spoke through the prophet Isaiah. You know, it's funny when you prepare a message, um, it's always a little alarming on Saturday morning when you're doing your devotion and you read words from scripture that have nothing, they're nowhere near in the Bible to what you're going to preach on. And the Holy Spirit says, you got to read this tomorrow. And you start editing. And that's what happened yesterday. And I think these words from the book of Isaiah remind us that our God has been this great God all along from the very beginning until today and into the future. This is what God spoke to the people. And I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes and listen to these words spoken by God speaking about who God is. This is what the Lord says. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. I am the Lord. And there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Did you catch that, friends? The reason God strengthens us is so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, People, including the atheist, including the people who don't acknowledge Jesus, will know that our God is the Lord and there is no other. Let us remember the words Jesus spoke. Blessed are those who have not seen and who have yet believed. Let us believe in the resurrection about which we are going to sing. We are going to say words Our God has robbed the grave and the resurrected king is resurrecting me. Believe it. Even though you didn't see it, you are going to experience. And let us answer the question, is there a God with the answer of the blind man? Yes, Lord, I believe. 